Throughout his lengthy life, Charlie Munger has created a set of beliefs that have helped him and his family become extremely successful and wealthy. In today's video, we'll hear Charlie outline 10 of these concepts that have helped him amass a net worth of more than $2 billion. Welcome to Financial Market TV. If you're new to the channel and enjoy content like this, hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. Also, please don't hesitate to share your comments down below and give this video a like. Let's get started. Number 10. Becoming a Learning Machine However, another important secret is to excel in lifelong learning. You have a great edge if you keep learning all the time, according to Charlie. Number 9. Learn from past mistakes Now, there's a stage in life where you have to figure out how to get out of your blunders without spending too much money. Charlie has also participated in some of these activities. Consider Berkshire Hathaway's initial businesses, the Doom Department Store, the Doom New England Textile Company, and the Doom Trading Stamps Company. Berkshire Hathaway was formed as a result of these small businesses. They did a good job at it by investing them at low cost. However, their success was based on them changing their practices and entering better businesses. It wasn't that they were particularly adept at completing challenging tasks, it was that they excelled at avoiding difficult situations and locating simpler methods. Number 8. Deserve what you want in order to get it. Charlie was indoctrinated at a young age with the belief that the safest way to achieve what you want is to deserve it. It's a very simple concept. There is no better mentality for any lawyer or any person in the world to have than the golden rule where you want to deliver to the world what you would buy if you were on the other end. People that have these ethos on the whole gain respect and deserve trust from the people they deal with in life. And there's a lot of joy in life to be had from receiving well-deserved trust. And so the way to get it is to deliver what you want to buy if the circumstances were reversed. Number seven, take advantages of opportunities that come your way. Charlie was extremely fortunate in that he had an ancestor that he actually never met. His great-grandfather was a pioneer, according to his mother, and he came out to Iowa, where he and his young wife lived in a sod house that was technically a cave for two winters long. He literally rose from nothing to become the town's leading banker, a well-respected citizen and a generous man. He teamed together with Andrew Carnegie to give Algona the town library. Charlie's great-grandmother made the grandfather do it, since his great-grandfather would have never done it by himself, and he made him put up his giant tarpon in the library as part of the gift. Having wrested this success from hardship and danger and trouble from being a captain on the Black Hawk Wars, he had this theory looking back at his long life with his unusual success, and he owned a bunch of farms at the end that he leased the Germans. But you couldn't lose money at leasing a farm to a German in Iowa. Naturally, it was successful. But what he said over and over again to his grandchildren, including Charlie's mother, was that real opportunities that come to you are few. It's a very fortunate life, but most people only get a few times throughout theirs. But it can make a huge difference when they see such a huge activity. And he said, when you find one, my dear grandchildren, you can clearly recognize that, he says, seize them boldly and don't do it small. Charlie's mother, who wasn't interested in finance, liked to transmit the family quirks down the family line. Of course, Charlie totally adopted his point of view, and you can say it worked wonderfully. You assume that you're really gonna have major opportunities in life, but they're gonna be very few. And when you get the next Lollapalooza, please don't hang by like a timid little rabbit. Don't sit back. There aren't many of the really big good ones left. Number six, underspending your income. This business of cost cutting and living modestly, that was the secret. If you always spend less than you earn, you will live long enough, you get wealthy, and that's it. It's not really that difficult. Number five, stick to your circle of competence. One guy at the Berkshire meeting from one of the foreign publications asked Charlie why a couple of guys in a little place in Omaha could do so much better than all the powerful minds in great institutions. Charlie replied, well, he thinks that Warren knows the edge of the competency better as well as he does than other people do, and that's humility in the umbrella sense. It is a very important thing to know, he says over and over again. It's not a competency if you don't know the edge of it. You are a disaster if you don't know the edge of your own competency. 
Warren frequently says, I'd rather deal with a guy with an IQ of 130 who thinks it's 125 than a guy with an IQ of 180 that thinks it's 200. That second guy will kill you. And so it is very important to know the edge of your own competency. Number four, ignore the economic future predictions. Warren and Charlie haven't gotten far in life by making accurate macroeconomic forecasts and placing bets on their outcomes. Their strategy is to swim as well as they possibly can. And the tide will be with them at times and against them at others. But they don't bother attempting to forecast the tides because they have been planning to play the game for a very long time. Charlie advises that we adopt the same mentality. Guessing macroeconomic cycles is both a trap and a delusion. Only a few people succeed at it, and some of them do it by accident. When the game is that tough, why not adopt the other system of swimming as competently as you can, and figure that over a long life, you'll have your share of good tides and bad tides. He thinks that you can count on more booms than busts over your remaining lifetime. How big and with what kind of a cycle? He can't tell you. All he can say is that the best way of coping is to put your head down and behave credibly every day. Number three, there is hard work, but there is also the role of luck in life. It's amazing how things work out if you simply wake up every morning and keep hammering at things. Have some discipline and keep learning. Charlie believes that aspiring to be president of the US, a billionaire, or something like that is a bad idea because the odds are excessively stacked against you. It is far better to aim low. He had no intention of becoming wealthy. He aspired to be self-sufficient, but he went too far. Furthermore, some of the overshooting was unintentional. You can be really deserving, clever, and diligent, but there's also a degree of luck involved. And the people are rewarded with positive outcomes that appear to be amazing. They're the people who have discipline and intelligence as well as good virtues plus a hell lot of luck. Why wouldn't the world work like that? So you shouldn't give credit for the unusual. There are a lot of people that just look into the right place and rise, and there are a lot of very eminent people who have loads of advantages, but if they get one little flaw or one bit of bad luck, then they're mired in misery their whole lives. Don't be like that. Number two, avoid fake gurus. I have this book that I will show you how to make 300% a year, says someone on television, and all you have to do is pay for postage and I'll deliver it to you. How probable is it that someone who has discovered a means to make 300% a year trying to sell books on the internet will do so again? Nonetheless, this is modern commerce, and those who work in it all day consider themselves valuable. The jargon is created by the advertising agents. They say it's for insurance. The two customers that switch from Geico to Glotz Insurance save $400 each. But what they don't tell you is that there are only two of them in the entire United States. And they're both nuts. They mislead you on purpose. It's not right that people are deliberately misled, according to Charlie. Number one, take the high road. Charlie's father had this best friend and client, but he also had this other client who, in his own words, was a big blowhard. And Charlie's father was always working for this big blowhard, who was just a terrible person. So Charlie asked his father why he wouldn't work for his wonderful best friend client instead. The father replied by saying that the big blowhard is an endless source of legal troubles, always in trouble, overreaching, and misbehaving. Whereas, with Grant McFadden, the friendly client, treats everybody right. The employees, everything, the customers, if he gets involved with someone on a psychotic rage at work, Grant walks over there and makes grace immediately. So a man like that doesn't need a lawyer. His father was attempting to educating Charlie to the point that he actually aspired to be like Grant McFadden. It was effective in this regard. Peter Hoffman always tells Charlie that if the thieves realize how much money they might make by being honest, they would all act differently. Warren has a beautiful phrase that everyone might benefit from. You take the high road, it's never crowded. Thanks for watching the whole video. Again, if you're new and like this type of content, subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to leave a comment down below and hit that like button. Also, click on the notification bell to get updated on our weekly uploads. See you in the next video!